The Unshackled Waves, episode 136. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It was another big news week, both here in Australia and around the world. This week saw Bill Shorten's newest tax grab, with him wanting to remove dividend imputation refunds for self-funded retirees. There was the South Australian state election, where we saw the Liberals win a majority, ending 16 years of Labor rule and Nick Xenophon's SA Best tanking. In the inner Melbourne seat of Batman, Labor's Jed Carney pulled off an impressive win against a divided Green Party. In the UK, we have seen its police state grow even worse, with the leaders of Britain First jailed. Activist Tommy Robinson was assaulted by Antifa and had three of his friends deported. We also saw another Muslim sex gang scandal in the city of Telford. Also in the UK, we saw the poisoning of Russian double agent Sergei Skrupal and his daughter Yulia with the finger being pointed at Russia. The big news out of the United States is Donald Trump firing Secretary of State Rex Tillerson after months of tension. To discuss the week, I'm joined by Deputy Editor of The Unshackled and host of Front and Centre podcast, Emilia Garcia. This is The Unshackled Waves Review Show. Emilia, welcome back to the show. Hey Tim, thanks for having me. In Australia, opposition leader Bill Shorten announced a bold new policy this week. He wants to remove debit and imputation franking credits, uh, which uh, in the past has uh, allowed uh, self-funded retirees to receive uh, cash refunds from the tax office. This is because uh, the company tax rate is 30% and the, uh, for self-funded retirees, the, their tax rate is 15%, so uh, they were getting uh, with their dividend payment, what's termed franking credits, which means that uh, rather than being uh, taxed twice, they got 15% uh, back from the, t- the tax office. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Shorten sees that as a uh, big uh, uh, tax concession, and so he, and he's also seen it as a big uh, pot of money that he can uh, tax, and so he, it's estimated that this will raise $59 billion. However, it is a form of double taxation because it's taxing uh, income at both the company level and then also at the uh, self-funded retirees level. So, um, and Bill Shorten thought he was onto a winner with this because it's the latest in his uh, class warfare um, quest. And there was also a bit of intergenerational warfare, <coughs> warfare as well. The fact that or all the wealth is being hoarded by these, you know, baby boomers, and I'm going to give some to, you know, the the young people who are struggling on low to middle income. But uh, he seems to have overplayed his hand this week and uh, miscalculated the backlash. He's already um, uh, ba- uh, backtracked a bit already, saying he for um, part pensioners he may introduce a supplement uh, payment mm-hmm. and it's also given the, the Turnbull government a golden opportunity to launch a you know, attack campaign and scare campaign. Absolutely. I mean, I think politically this was one of the stupider things someone has done this year politically, you know, other than impregnating a woman right after advocating for uh, traditional family and, uh, you know, good old traditional values. But essentially, <clears throat> pardon me, what you see here is um, is just kind of messing with a group of people that you don't really want to mess with. I mean, politically, it's just not very popular to say, you know, these cute old people who are retiring, I'm going to do something to make their life less well off. And obviously, uh, obviously, it's scary. And even people that don't understand it as well, they still see this as kind of nefarious, kind of, uh, you know, taxing somebody twice. And then, then he goes on to say that they will that there will be dividends given back to the retirees which seem to kind of defeat the purpose if you're trying to save money by not by by taking essentially that money that they would have received through this kind of loophole well then you're defeating the purpose you're basically going to give them that money in dividends so what exactly he was trying to achieve i'm not really sure but he it definitely didn't go the way he planned oh it's not just hitting uh well <clears throat> well off self-funded retirees but also those you know because they've been told um, you know, o- older Australians to, 
you know save for your retirement so you don't become a uh, burden on the on the tax system and, and so a lot of these um, you know older Australians have done the right thing you know are going to finance their retirement uh, themselves and yet they're, they're now going to be uh, taxed and like I said many of them are par pensioners and many of them could be pushed on to the full pension they're certainly not uh, wealthy and, and so you know it's not you know these you know rich you know self-funded retirees you know like got all this money uh, Crypt away, like like it's going to be hitting you know people who've just been you know frugal with, uh, with their money, and and that's where yeah. Bill, Bill Shorten has really uh, misjudged things. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the issues also is that um, you know you, nowadays with uh, you know especially uh, people our age kind of see it like uh, almost impossible to conceive that you would be able to fund your retirement without uh, without being very wealthy. But essentially what you have here is just a group of people who are really fiscally conservative, uh, responsible rather, probably fiscally conservative, and uh, just basically found a way to save up enough money while they were working to then have a comfortable retirement after. And so yeah, essentially this is uh, this is basically telling them that you know you were fiscally responsible, you're not a burden on the state, and we're going to take more money from you because of it, which, which is odd. So I mean, as you say, this is essentially, um, <clears throat> this put the brakes on his possibility at really advancing politically. I think he was rising in popularity and you know, he had a Turnbull kind of on the on the decline and he just took all of that uh, all that traction and turned it on its head. Uh, I wrote uh, this week that it could be uh, Bill Shorten's birthday cake moment. Now I should explain what I mean <coughs> about that is that in the 1993 uh, federal election, the, the Liberal opposition under John Hewson took their economic uh, package uh, fight back. It was 650 pages long. It's, it was referred to as the longest political suicide known in Australian history. Part of that was uh, he wanted to introduce a 15% uh, GST. And because there was a, a large backlash to uh, that proposal, he said, OK, I'll exempt uh, food and he, he was asked in an interview with uh, Mike Willisey um, if I you know bought a birthday cake um, you know would that attract the GST would it be you know more expensive or less expensive and uh, John Hewson said you know I, I'd have to know you know exactly what type of uh, cake it was to give you a detailed answer and of course the lad Willisey to say well if you don't know you have a problem with the uh, the policy and uh, Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating relentlessly attacked uh, fight back and uh, John Hewson ended up losing the, what was termed the unlosable election and uh, people are saying that uh, could uh, Bill Shorten with this you know, uh, pr a pretty you know, out there economic policy, could he lose the, the unlosable election because uh, Labor's been ahead in uh, past 28 news polls, it's almost looking certain that they'll win the next election. Could Bill Shorten, by over overplaying this, could he actually uh, uh, fall apart and and lose what what looks like to be an unlosable election? But then again, uh, you know, is Malcolm Turnbull or Paul Keating, can he, you know, ferociously attack, you know, Bill Shorten and, you know, unleash a really effective scare campaign? Uh, I mean, I am very skeptical of trying to call any election at this point. It just seems, uh, it almost seems like a waste of time, and honestly, with uh, with recent history. But yeah, essentially, essentially, first, it's it just what he did now was basically do everything negatively to his own image that he possibly could. I mean, taxes, higher taxes, it's always scary. Even though people will say that it won't affect you, it's still just not a good prospect to think that there will be less money in the pockets of Australians. Whether or not uh, you think that that will affect you directly or not, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's just an, an uncomfortable prospect. And on the other hand, yeah, it basically gives a, a huge amount of ammunition to the opposition because he went after uh, basically kind of a weaker group of people, you know, after retirees. You're generally not supposed to lower the quality of life. It's all supposed to make their quality of life better. So you go after you know these adorable old people you know retiring on their uh, on their front porch and it's just not good for your image. So yeah, absolutely, uh, it would seem now that he basically had his uh, birthday cake moment. But to say uh, you know who who knows what could come up in the next um, in the next news cycle that could maybe you know bring down Turnbull and push up Shorten once again. 
Yeah, I don't have much faith that you know Turnbull can can do a Keating. I mean, if you just look at the the last uh, uh, federal election, I mean, uh, uh, Turnbull's you know campaign was pathetic. I mean, they they hardly you know laid a finger on uh, Labor and Bill Shorten, and of course Labor had that you know very effective yet you know completely dishonest Medicare you know campaign. I mean, you know. Can Turnbull, can he, you know, go ferociously, uh, you know, really, you know, play, uh, play dirty and, you know, do do what uh, do what it takes to, to get short? And I just don't see that, you know, he has he has it in him. And uh, you rightly pointed out there there that you know Turnbull he always has a way of you know stuffing things up. There's probably another scandal around the corner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll see. I mean, definitely. I think uh, Turnbull uh, became became prime minister more, more than anything because. Uh, because he wanted to, it's kind of like an ego play for him. You know, he's a former businessman who decided to try his hand at politics. So I think that what he's trying to do is basically just finish his term. I think that I think that that's his ultimate goal. He wants to be finally one of the one of the ones that isn't pushed out before his term is over. So uh, I definitely think that that he he'll he'll resort to what he has to in order to in order to to get you know his full term. But then again, yeah, we haven't we haven't really seen his uh, his capacity. Earlier on, to to kind of play dirty, to play politics the way uh, some other politicians would be willing to. So, uh, I mean, I guess we'll have to wait and see. We already knew that the UK was a police state, but it seems to have gotten a whole lot worse in the the past week. Uh, we saw uh, Britain first uh, two leaders, Paul Golding and Jada Franson, jailed after being found guilty for uh, religiously aggravated harassment. Uh, this was uh, during their activism in the town of Kent during a Muslim gang rape uh, trial. Subsequently, Britain first has been banned from Facebook under pressure from the UK government and Paul Golding was uh, bashed in jail, which a lot of people uh, feared given that the UK has a, a high uh, Muslim prison population. And then we also mm -hmm. saw um, anti-Islam activist Tommy Robinson assaulted by Antifa in London and his friends, uh, Brittany Pettibone, Martin Selner and Lauren Southern, uh, all deported, Where we, which basically, I mean, um, they, Tommy Robinson is a UK citizen, they can't you know, get rid of him, but they can, you know, block anyone who sympathizes with him or is critical of Islam entering the UK. And it's just, you know, really scary that, you know, free speech is is dead. And, you know, you're not... Uh, it seems to me <coughs> that the UK authorities, they're, they're, they either, you know, believe that, you know, these people are, you know, racist and bigoted or whatever, or that they're so terrified that, you know, if Muslims are offended, uh, you know, they'll they'll commit violence and terrorism that they've just got to suppress you know all criticism of them uh i mean it is it is scary and uh one of the things that i'll say is that th what's happening here and it's, and it's happening in australia also not quite as pronounced as uh as in london but i think we're headed in that direction is that anything that isn't seemed anything that isn't deemed like kosher speech anything that people uh, disagree with kosher rather uh it's going to be criminally uh, attacked. It's, it's, it's not even uh, a matter of condemning it. It's not a matter of saying, we really disagree with this group of people. We think that what they're saying is wrong. We think what they're saying is inaccurate. Uh, you know, it's race baiting, this and that. No, no, no. It's, it's, we're going to attack it uh, fr from a legal point of view. And that's very dangerous because one of the most important things about free speech uh, is actually defending the speech that is rather unpopular because, because for for speech that uh, that everyone that everyone agrees on, you don't really need freedom of speech. Uh, no no one is gonna, no one is going to suppress your right to say you know that puppies are cute or something. You know every something that everyone agrees with, that that's always going to be that's always going to be all right. So it's really it's really scary to see. Uh, even though I'm no fan of the people that have been uh, banned and the people that have been jailed, like I still stand up for their right to say whatever they have to say. If they believe that these things are an imminent threat to their country, they should have every every right to. Uh, to say it, and they should be protected by the government, not banned, not ostracized, and not jailed by the government for saying it. So, uh, I mean, the, the police state uh, in, in the UK is definitely is definitely very scary, and, and the idea that somebody should not be able to say something uh, something about a certain religion just because some people of that religion might find it offensive uh, is a terrifying prospect. Uh, Martin Selner, who's an Austrian identitarian leader, he was uh, entering the UK, among other things, to interview uh, Tommy Robinson, but also to give a, a speech in 
uh, at a rally in Hyde Park, which was ironically about defending free speech. <laughs> I mean, what what else can you expect at this point? It seems like uh, well, I, I think this is something that we're seeing everywhere. This categorization of a very broad uh, categorization of speech as hate speech, and then the subsequent shutting down of that speech, and that 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 obviously it, it kind of gives them the thumbs up to say, well, we believe in free speech. But speech that is hate speech, that's what we're going to shut down. So if you want to go talk about freedom of speech, of course, please do go ahead. Just don't say anything bad about Antifa, don't say anything bad about certain groups, and then we'll support you. And obviously that's antithetical to the whole idea of freedom of speech. And if you see, if you want a good model for freedom of speech, even though it's kind of starting to change a little, uh, at, at least from a governmental point of view, uh, look to the U.S. In the U.S., you, you are allowed to say anything. You can say the most egregious things in the world and it's your legally protected right to do so. And even though people want to change that, which I think is a really important fundamental pillar to Western society, uh, it's it's still it's still a good model and I don't think that people will stand for it. I don't think that people are going to stand for, uh, for the government shutting down speech that they think is offensive. Well, Peter Byrne, Selner and Southern, they're all uh, suing the, the UK government now. I will see how far they go with that because yeah, they were all detained under the the terrorism act. Well, mm. I I don't think they were they were terrorism. The UK authorities were uh, worried that you know they would you know provoke, and, and uh, basically the the UK government they're basically proving these people's point that you know Muslims they're you know so you know fragile and you know sensitive that you know they can't yeah. uh, we have to protect them from uh, criticism otherwise you know they're going to terrorize our country. That's basically what the implication. I mean, yeah, yeah, it, it really is ridiculous, and it's, uh, it, it, it's scary, and obviously, obviously these people were not going to do anything that even resembles uh, terrorism. I mean, obviously that was, not the, that was not an actual concern. Clearly they were just looking for a way that they could legally uh, keep these people out of the country to the other, to the other uh, two people who are in jail now. You know, they, they basically just, they're kind of just like playing, uh, playing politics in a sense. They're just seeing what's on the books that they could then use to legally lock these people up and shut them down and not have them say what they need to say. So uh, obviously that's, that's very terrifying. And when it, com when it comes to the Muslim community of, um, of England, one of the issues is that, that there, there are two extremes to where people saying that there's no problem and then people saying that it's like an imminent horrible threat. Obviously the, the, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. But that you can't say that it's kind of scary that you know 30% uh, of the Muslims in, in, uh, in London think that homosexuality should be punishable by death in London. Uh, I think that that's something that people should be concerned about, especially from a cultural point of view. Um, you know, the, the the UK is a lot like uh, like Australia or like uh, any real modern westernized country. That you know, we have to accept people's way uh, of life, and and that's kind of like what we talk about being you know in, in a liberal democracy. So should people be jailed for voicing their their concerns over a huge uh, cultural gap, such as the one that we see between the Muslim community and the general community of of London? Uh, I don't think so. Well, uh, while you know they've been busy banning uh, critics of Islam from the UK, there was another uh, Muslim uh, sex gang child abuse scandal this time in the uh, city of Telford, and this <coughs> is uh, five years after the Rotherham sex scandal was it was exposed in Telford. Right. There's over a thousand. Uh, uh, female victims, some um, uh, as young as 11, and, and you know the, these girls were you know uh, raped and drugged and and bashed by these gangs. But of course the the UK authorities they knew what was going on, but you know were fear of being called racist. And uh, what you know is so disgusting about the the media reporting of this scandal is they describe the gangs as Asian. Uh, and who they define it, what, what that actually means is that they're they're Pakistani Muslims, and but right. so so they use this broad term as Asian, which I which I think that you know that, that basically slanders you know like Chinese, yeah. uh, you know Vietnamese, <clears throat> uh, Japanese, Korean, like you know, those yeah. those are the people I consider Asian. I don't consider mm -hmm. you know Pakistani Asians. I mean you know that is, you know that is I think an unfair slur. Well, I mean, yeah, essentially, uh, when you call them Asians, yeah, technically it is correct. They, they're, they're from Asia, they're from the continent of Asia, that's uh, not incorrect. But essentially what you're saying is true, and when, when you talk about, about Asians, especially uh, Asians in the West, uh, 
like pro proper what people would actually call call Asians, uh, they tend to be more successful societally uh, in terms of education, in terms of the amount of money they make, in terms of uh, their uh, their uh, levels of crime. You know, they're 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 a pretty successful group. So we see them as kind of a group of people that you know, if if you want to say a couple of bad things about them, that'll be fine. Uh, as opposed to Muslims who who aren't uh, who aren't doing uh, as well. But obviously, this is one of the issues that that I see, and I think most people would be a, in agreement that. When it comes to this sex scandal, this horrible, horrible thing that came to light, um, I don't think most people would be as concerned about the fact that they're Muslims as much as the fact that they're that they're rapists. I mean, that that that's the issue, and you see, you see the community, uh, even like let's say the conservative community, um, getting just as upset if it were uh, when we've seen some Christian. Uh, sex scandals when we've seen uh, some Christian priests or, or people people that are that are associated with the with the Christian Church uh, abusing girls at a large scale the 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 outrage is similar to the one that you would see uh, if it's uh, if it's a bunch of Muslim men or if it were uh, any type of person but the issue here is that they're saying well we need to be very sensitive and we can't bring up the fact that they're uh, that this is a, a group of Muslim people because because then it'll seem insensitive and it'll seem uh, uh, offensive and it's just um, it's just a shame because, because what they're doing now is essentially saying this is a group of people that you can never bring up one part of their identity as to make sure that they that their feelings are not hurt or that they don't uh, that they don't react in an adverse way and and that's terrifying that's it's terrifying to create a, a protected group that, that cannot be attacked because because of their feelings. And given that this is the the second scandal to be you know covered up and ignored and there's only uh, just got out now, you wonder how many other cities in the the UK this is happening in. You know these you know young girls being abused. Yet we don't know about it yet. But, you know because there's this uh, you know cover up by by the authorities. I mean uh, that's what a lot of people are going to wonder. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean essentially that 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 um, the, the UK would move to ban political commentators who are clearly not going to do anything violent, that that would be their priority, and then to turn around and allow uh, people to get away with these egregious crimes just because they want to seem like good, virtuous people. Uh, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. And again, we, it, it, as you say, we really don't know uh, the extent to which this is happening. It could be more or less severe than we think. But the issue is that since, since the numbers are being fudged and since the, they're not being for they're not being forthcoming with the actual facts of the matter as to uh, as to decrease the the level of public uh, sentiment uh, negative public sentiment uh, then we'll then we'll we'll never really know unless unless there's a big change in how they choose to do things. The UK government has been uh, pretty uh, busy dealing with the uh, diplomatic fallout from uh, an alleged uh, Russian uh, poisoning on their soil of a uh, former Russian uh, double agent. Now, uh, I've obviously seen this story in the news, but I haven't been following it too closely. So, Emilio, I'll let you take the lead on this one. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, this guy, he was, uh, he was actually in the UK seeking political asylum. He he basically thought that the uh, that the government of Russia was uh, was out to get him. Essentially, he feared for his life, so he he moved uh, to to London, and they accepted him as a political refugee. Now, what you see is that there was a chemical agent released, uh, and uh, and it affected him and uh, another girl in, in a very uh, in a very strong way. Uh, they're uh, they're both in critical condition in the hospital, but actually, twenty more people were treated. Uh, because of this chemical agent that was released, uh, essentially to target this guy and uh, ultimately, ultimately kill him, and the, the intelligence shows that essentially the, the the government of Russia was the one who who directed this attack. Now, uh, Theresa May obviously has been extremely, extremely strong in in condemning this and um, you know uh, kicking out uh, Russian diplomats from the country. And what we saw is that uh, a short time after Theresa May said this and shared the intelligence with the United States. Uh, the condemnation uh, on behalf of the United States uh, also also took took part. So uh, I mean, I, I, t at this point, it seems almost impossible to think that that Russia was not in charge, uh, did not direct this attack. Uh, every intelligence community, every intelligence organization, relevant intelligence organization uh, internationally, uh, says that the that the evidence to suggest that Russia was in, was responsible is overwhelming. And uh, even though you know Donald Trump didn't didn't want to didn't want to condemn uh, Russia quite so fast, 
uh, he did he did after a while say that that, that it was uh, that it was pretty evident that that Russia that Russia did this. Why did they make it so obvious, Russia? I mean, you know, poisoning, <laughs> like, it's a uniquely Russian way of uh, assassination. <laughs> They've been doing this for, you know, over a over hundred years. And, of course, it's, you know, caused, you know, massive you know, tension between, you know, Russia and, and basically, you know, the rest of Europe. Are they deliberately trying to be, you know, provocative and, you know, flex their muscle and say, you know, we're, we're you know, here and, you know, we're, we're going to look after our interests? Uh, I think that that's part of the course of, of Russia, as we've seen, uh, as we've seen uh, even relatively recently in recent history. Uh, they've definitely been flexing their muscles, and they're definitely trying to attack uh, institutions internationally that they believe are antithetical to what they're trying to achieve, to expanding their uh, their influence, all these things. And so, yeah, I, I do think that that. Uh, I mean, well, I, sh I shouldn't be too quick to say, but I, I think that it would be. It, it's not a stretch to say that that if they wanted to be more subtle in the way that they did this, they would have been able to. Uh, however, you also see that um, that having NATO, the UK, the US, and everyone else uh, kind of uh, condemning you, opposing you, and establishing sanctions on you uh, is not going to do great things for your for your economy. It's not going to do great things for your influence, and it's not going to do great things for your interests. So, uh, when it comes to to how to the motivations, if, if there were other political motivations other than just to kill this guy, uh, I'm not really sure. But uh, de definitely, Russia d dug a hole for themselves, whether it was whether it was intentional or not. And other nations, including Western nations, have you know assassinated you know spies of other nations before. I mean, you know, this is nothing new in the history of uh, you know espionage and intelligence. Uh, gathering. It's it's just that it you know was made so obvious, and the fact that you know Russia uh, in, in this decade is the new boogeyman again. Mm. That, that that's essentially right. I mean, what you see now is since there is like the common enemy of Russia now, and uh, everything that they do uh, nefarious as it is, because I mean they do do some nefarious things. Uh, it's going to be exaggerated because the narrative of them being just basically like this you know extremely powerful, hostile uh, foreign uh, entity. Uh, it, it, plays well. And so, for example, I mean, when it comes to meddling in the election, um, no one denies that, that they did. Uh, people deny whether or not they were involved directly with Donald Trump or not. Probably not. Uh, that's, that's another story. But they definitely, they definitely were trying to influence the election. That's something we know. Uh, but then people think, well, what's the big deal? <laughs> like, the United States and a lot of other Western countries, Western powers, rather, have been trying to affect the outcome of the, the elections of many countries, and it was never seen as something as nefarious. Uh, so yeah, a, a basically anything that even is uh, is pretty ordinary for countries to undertake, uh, the second that Russia does it, uh, it's going to be overplayed. And the reason it's going to be overplayed is because, as you say, they're the boogeyman, and we need to make sure that anything that they do, is, is, as long as it seems uh, slightly nefarious, uh, will attack with, um, with the full extent uh, of political uh, uh, power that, that that can be that can be taken. However, uh, one of the things that I have to say though is that that doesn't excuse uh, Russia's behavior just because uh, other countries do it, and just because you see other countries meddling in elections, or because you see other other uh, governments um, assassinating uh, people in foreign countries. That doesn't mean that Russia's okay to do it. Oh no, I never say I said they were okay to do it. I was just you know saying right. why is that you know especially. Outrageous, and even Australia's uh, political leaders have seen fit to comment on it. Uh, Julie Bishop, our foreign minister, said yesterday, you know, uh, we sh we should look at sending you know weapons inspectors to Russia to you know, oh, you're going to look at all the different poisons. <laughs> and I think we only did that for nuclear weapons, and uh, Tony right. Abbott, who you know infamously said he wanted to shirt front. Vladimir Putin over the um, uh, the Russian shooting down that Malaysia Airlines uh, mm. plane ha has also said you know we need to you know get tough on you know Russia so you know it's there's a lot of you know virtue signaling of you know how much we we don't like Russia and I, I think the media commentary has actually been quite right that we've almost returned to you know Cold War era type uh, you know relations here. I mean, yeah, this is true. And again, Russia has brought a lot of this on itself. Uh, it's true that what they have done is, is not necessarily, uh, you know, there 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 are definitely West, uh, there are definitely countries that are doing far more egregious things, though on a very small scale, because they're just not as powerful as Russia is. But uh, to say that that Russia is 
is some kind of you know misunderstood uh, country that's actually really nice and and wonderful and maybe we should give them another chance. No, they are a hostile foreign power. They are uh, looking for to expand many interests that are antithetical to uh, to Western uh, ideals and Western interests, and we should be concerned. Uh, however, to say that. Uh, that Russia, you know, it, it, to say that they are this enormous imminent threat, they are a threat. But to say that this is like the, it, that this is like the Cold War, that that that, that you know, uh, nukes are going to start flying across the Atlantic, uh, no, not quite yet. United States President uh, Donald Trump said you're fired to another member <laughs> of his. Uh, administration, though he doesn't you know, say you're fired anymore, he fires uh, people on Twitter. This time it yeah. was uh, Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson, who uh, there had been you know, quite a bit of tension between them last few months, including when Tillerson denied calling Trump a, uh, a moron. <laughs> so um, you know, uh, Mike Pompeo will be new uh, Secretary of State. Rex Tillerson clearly felt uh, humiliated by being you know, fired on Twitter and didn't even mention uh, Trump in his uh, parting uh, address. Uh, now, the, the conspiracy theorists were out saying that because Tillerson had said Russia was responsible for the uh, uh, poisoning of the of the double agent that, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin rang him up and said, you've got to fire uh, Tillerson. I don't think that's how that went down. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I would say not because now Donald Trump has actually kind of jumped on the bandwagon and condemned Russia for that. Uh, and also, not every time that, that Trump does something, it's it's not because uh, of Russia. So let's let's get our head uh, kind of out of our ass in that sense. The idea here is that Donald Trump did this uh, thing to Tillerson because of some nefarious reason. But we know, and I was saying this on the heterodox the other night when we were on on the show together, that this is the longest exit that we've ever seen uh, in politics. I mean. Tillerson was on his way out from the second he was in. Uh, they there were constant disagreements. Uh, obviously, uh, it, it, there was open uh, kind of conflict when it came to his relationship with Trump. Uh, then again, as you said, like he called him a fucking moron, and then he went on to not discuss it. People said like, "Well, did you say it? like, oh, I don't want to talk about that?" Which is, you know, the non-answer answer is kind of like, "Yeah, <laughs> I did call him that." So, so yeah, I mean. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, that kind of Donald Trump kind of likes to surround himself with people that agree with him, uh, people that aren't gonna you know kind of have the contrary point of view or they're not gonna be contrarians. And um, clearly, clearly uh, Tillerson was was uh, a contrarian, and I think Donald Trump just got sick of it. Uh, uh, given, uh, given you know that uh, relationship, how it's deteriorated, I'm surprised that Jeff Sessions is still Attorney General. I mean, you know, they've been you know at each other for. Uh, yeah, even longer. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, I think I think uh, this guy has just um, within within the um, how do I say this? Yes, Jeff Sessions has not been you know Trump's uh, wingman uh, definitely, but he has followed most of what Trump wanted from him. So despite the fact that Trump is still really pissed off about uh, him recusing. Rec rec Accusing himself uh, from the Russia investigation, among among another, a, a bevy of other things, it seems that they're still um, satisfied with their relationship so far. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you you see Donald Trump definitely, you know, kind of uh, firing anyone that he sees uh, as having taken, you know, the opposite view from him. And we actually saw this a while back when he uh, apparently was about to fire um, Mueller uh, because he was just sick of the Russia investigation. And the only reason that he didn't fire him was because the the um, the official lawyer of the White House basically said, if you do it, I'll, I'll, I'll quit. And so that's why he didn't do it. And recently we also saw him uh, direct his lawyer to call uh, Robert Mueller and to officially uh, request that he end the Russia investigation. This comes right after uh, Mueller subpoenaed the, the Trump Organization for documents. So, I mean, to say that Donald Trump is, uh, is going to fire anybody that he sees as not, uh, not helping his interests uh, well, I mean, that's that's pretty obvious, and I mean, his catchphrase is, you're fired, so I don't think people should be that surprised. Uh, and, and many people uh, didn't think that he'd, uh, you know, t take it with him to the, to the White House, uh, so, yeah. so literally, because uh, let, let's have a look at, uh, you know, he is, you know, two main, you know, people, uh, Chief of Staff Rance Priebus, Chief Strategist Steve Bannon, they're, they're gone, Sean Spicer, uh, he, he's gone as well. Yeah, uh, James uh, I mean, Comey, uh, he was uh, probably the the most famous firing. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you actually see Donald Trump and the people that he went into the White House with 
and they're almost all gone. And in fact, a lot of the a lot of the people that left, they left in a very short span of time. I mean, that 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 was uh, that must have caused a lot of a lot of chaos in the White House. But uh, but yeah, he's very unconventional in that sense. He definitely he's definitely a firing. He he has kind of like a. Uh, a mechanism of uh, defense, I think, almost to just get rid of anyone who pisses him off enough. So yeah, I mean, w we're seeing basically him just fire anyone who who is not fulfilling their role anymore. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think it's a really bad thing. I think it's really bad to to basically have a new player uh, in the White House every day, kind of you know starting from zero. But definitely, he's legally within his right to fire these people. And what we'll have to see, what I'm really interested in seeing, is what's going to happen right now with uh, with Mueller, because he does he does have the legal right to fire Mueller, but uh, people have told him not to because that would be politically extremely damaging to him. Uh, however, now he apparently is trying to to get him to stop it, essentially to stop the the investigation that he's uh, been tasked with, and. I mean, it could be again if he if he gets pissed off enough that he uh, that he decides to fire him, that would be that would be an amazing story to watch. Uh, I think that Trump wants to fire Mueller not because you know there's a like pee pee tape. I don't think that, that he just, <laughs> yeah, just because Mueller is he just seems to be snooping around you know Trump's you know business dealings, see if he can you know basically find you know, something to, you know, blackmail his associates with in the hope of, you know, that they'll have some smoking gun against him. Right. Well, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that, that, that Trump should be worried, and I think uh, uh, the, the issue is that the, the investigation of Robert Mueller isn't exclusively to, towards Russia. Uh, the, the investigation was to see his business dealings with Russia, to see uh, if he had any financial improprieties, to see if he was obstruction of justice. Now, it seems that with when it comes to obstruction of justice, there's a good case against Trump, even even though that was not his intention. Uh, there's a lot of, of evidence that's piled up to say that maybe he was um, trying to use his power as president to impede this investigation. And even if there was nothing that would come of the investigation, him uh, standing in the way of it could be seen as obstruction of justice. And other things that that Trump might be in violation of, uh, I, I, I'm forgetting what it's called right now. I think it's called the emolument emol emoluments clause. Sorry, I just got tongue tied there. Emoluments clause. A clause, and the, essentially it, it says uh, you cannot receive money as president from foreign powers, and you know you, you you basically shouldn't be using your presidency to enrich yourself. And what we're seeing now is that is that Donald Trump ha has done these things. I mean, whether it was on purpose or not, you know, he's still uh, responsible for his businesses, and he has received money from through the businesses from foreign powers, you know, to rent out uh, rooms at, at Trump hotels or to rent out ballrooms, to different things uh, in golf courses, and it, it, it's nefarious. So whether or not it, there's actually something there, uh, we don't really know yet. But Trump, you know, he, he, could, he could potentially be, be looking at some trouble. And the new Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, now the mainstream media is saying that, uh, uh, Pompeo is more aligned with, you know, Trump ideologically, and they've described that as hawkish on foreign policy. Now, you know, Trump uses, you know, strong rhetoric in, you know, diplomacy, as we saw, um, you know, with, with his dealings with North Korea and Kim Jong, uh, and, you know, calling him, you know, fat and <laughs> all, all, all that. Short. You know, yeah. uh, Trump is not a, you know, war, a warmonger, but, you know, he's a, you know, tough, you know, negotiator. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when it comes to to North Korea, obviously, you know, at first I was like, oh my god, like he has got to stop it. Like, what the fuck is wrong with him? Uh, and now, you know, he's made more progress than uh, any other president has managed to. So, you know, I, I you have to give him credit for that. Uh, it, it, is it good to have an eco chamber ideologically around Trump? Probably not, because as we've seen, even people that really, really like him say like he's doing these things that are just like really antithetical to what he's trying to achieve. And, you know, we kind of just wish he would cut it out. So I think that it would be better if, uh, if Donald Trump were better at working with people that he opposes ideologically. But yeah, essentially this guy, this new CIA director, he's far more aligned. He'll probably be far more loyal and far more, uh, how do you say, more privy to, to obeying Donald Trump's orders. We'll have to see how that works out. But uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely he'd, he'd look for someone who was a little bit more in line with what he wants. Oh, well, uh, tell us then the fact that, you know, he wanted to do the opposite with North Korea and it was Trump who ended up being, you know, right about, you know, how to approach the situation. I mean, you know, when there's that, you know, uh, 
you know, views are so markedly different and, you know, <laughs> your, the, the one who's advising you has turned out to be completely wrong, then, you know, obviously, you know, it's, you can no longer work together. Uh, yeah, naturally. So you did have this kind of era of strategic patience and uh, it, it was the international community's uh, kind of consensus that this was the proper thing to do, that essentially engaging with North Korea uh, in, in, in a real way was not the way to go about it. And so I, I understand his point of view because that's apparently what, what, what people thought was, was appropriate. Now obviously Donald Trump came in, uh, started kind of shaking things up, and, and we, see, we see this, uh, this change of, of heart on his part to at, least, uh, to at least come to the negotiating table. Uh, but at the same time, what we see when it comes to, um, to Donald Trump's kind of last minute moves and some things that, you know, he's kind of uh, unpredictable, I can understand why a lot of people would be, would be uncomfortable by this, you know, he's saying like, you know, we're, we're trying to make progress here and you're saying that, you know, little rocket man is fat and short and, you know, all, and that your button is bigger than he, than his. And uh, so I, I understand Rex Tillerson's point of view and he, you know, he was kind of adhering to the, to the standard ideology when it comes to, um, to North Korea, but yeah, it turns out that he was wrong. Well, it's been another busy news week. I'm sure there'll be another controversial policy, deportation or firing in the uh, next few weeks, and uh, we'll probably d uh, end up discussing that then. So thanks, Emilio, for uh, coming on the show again today. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. During the show, we didn't discuss the results of the South Australian election and Batman by-election, but you can view our analysis from our election night live stream, which is both on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. We don't have any further live events planned. However, I can confirm there will be some big changes coming to the show, which we'll be debuting in a week's time, so stay tuned for that. Also, don't forget if you want to take the Unshackled to the next level and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Uh, you can access that at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Don't forget, we also have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.